talking this morning about big events. Uh, noticed on my Facebook page, when you go in and enter a, an event, um, it will remind you of that so many days in advance. It will tell you uh, the date, the time, that sort of thing. I was talking this morning about God's calendar of events. And I am thoroughly convinced that the next big event, I'm not date setting, that's foolish. But the next big event on God's calendar of events is going to be the return of Jesus Christ. I was watching, it's been quite some time. And if you're familiar with David Jeremiah, he does programs from the pulpit there at Shadow Mountain. Plus that whole team goes out on the road. They're in big cities like New York. But he also does a set-down thing with uh, this particular case with Sheila Walsh, who is many years a contemporary Christian artist. And of course, she kind of leads the interview by asking questions. And I remember watching this, it's been several years ago. And if it was several years ago, then we are even closer now. The subject was the return of Christ. And she said, Dr. Jeremiah, without setting dates, and I know you can't do that, do you think we are near the return of the Lord? I'll never forget what he said. He said, Sheila, if we were able to see into God's heaven and know when that return is, he said it would probably scare most people to death. Now, if you're lost, individuals who know not Christ, it ought to be scary. But he went on to say, even Christians, it's so easy to get lulled into a situation where We've been hearing that all of our life. And by the way, the scripture addresses that. It says in the last days that there will be those who will say, you've been advocating this church, you've been preaching this, you've been teaching this for centuries. Nothing has happened. And it's real easy even for us. And I think that was what he was saying, that it would scare most of us to death. The 
the day and hour in which we are living is both scary and it's extremely exciting. It's frightening because of wars, rumors of wars, which, by the way, we are warned about. I mentioned this Wednesday night there are collations everywhere. There are countries coming together that 25 years ago would have been bitter enemies. But a hatred for Israel, number one. And Joe mentioned a lot of the strife that they are going through from the outside and inside. Pray for Israel. Situation with them. means that these countries are coming together because they hate Israel. That's one thing that they can agree on. And they hate the United States. That hatred is intensifying. It's growing in leaps and bounds. The economy... If you listen to an econ economist in this day and time, and if I listen to one, it's going to be a Christian a common. It's scary. It really is. Do you realize that the dollar, which has been the mainstay, is fading away? Now with the rise of China, the partnership with Russia. Now, they predict it'll only be a short period of time that the dollar will not be the principal money mark in the world. The leadership, or better put, lack of, scary, but at the same time, it's exciting because I believe it gets us closer and closer and closer to what we're going to look at tonight. We're going to look at what I'm going to call some chain of events that happened. And Jesus comes back. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. You Bible students know Paul's not talking about someone who's taken a nap, who's laid down for a rest. He's talking about those who have died. lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus, those who die in Jesus. This we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, those who have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall always be with the Lord. 
Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Seven things. We'll move through them quickly, I promise. Because they happen in rapid succession. Seven things happen. Paul begins with a realization. He tells the church at Thessalonica, there's something I want you to realize. There's a truth that Paul wants to teach this church. Verse 13, I do not want you to be ignorant. Paul's not being crude. He's not being rude. The word just means uninformed. I want you to be aware. That's what he's saying. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. That was one, and I've told you oft times, that was one of the things that was so intriguing to the gospel message. Because people had taken loved ones out and they had buried them. And those loved ones had heard the gospel and they had put their trust in Christ. But they were under the assumption that Jesus was going to come back while they were still living. But he didn't. And they had died. Those loved ones had passed away. And those who were left behind were in a panic. Then you always had the problem with those who didn't believe in a resurrection. It seems that certain Sadducees had infiltrated the church at Thessalonica and they had told the congregation that there's nothing to this thing of a resurrection, nothing to it, nothing whatsoever. So they were sad. They were brokenhearted. They grieved for those, their believing loved ones who had died. As far as they was concerned, that was the end. So you see why Paul said, I don't want you to be misinformed. I want you to be aware. There is a realization concerning those who are asleep in Jesus. Second, he talks about a rest. Verse 14. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Now, by the way, this does not infer a soul sleep. There are denominations that believe that when someone who has trusted in Christ dies, their soul goes into a rest. They are not cognizant. They are not aware of anything that's going on. Their body is laying in the ground. Their soul is sleeping. Now there's a problem with that. There's too many places in Scripture that teach us to be absent from the body is to be what? In a soul sleep? No. To be absent from the body for a believer is to be with the Lord. Aware of what's going on. Acutely aware. Now that's not the final estate. No. Because those saved souls are going to receive a body someday. We'll get there in a moment. That soul is not sleeping, if you will. It just implies a rest. And I'm good with that. You'll have to get Phyllis to tell you a story on RJ. 
and rest. It's a good one. Rest. The soul resting in Jesus. When the saint of God passes away, we enter into our eternal rest. We're resting in Jesus. We're awaiting the next big event which will take place as far as we're concerned. So there's a realization, there's a rest. And there's a revelation. Look at verse 15. We who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede or go before those who are asleep or those who have died. A revelation. Now Paul has given them new stuff. Stuff that they probably had been taught, but they had not grasped. He brings up the fact, the truth, that when Jesus comes back, there will be believers alive living on the earth. Now again, I don't want to over-speculate. The only thing I've told you so far is that in my spirit, I feel that we're near the coming of the Lord. Now I don't know what that says to you, but it says to me, Jesus may come in my lifetime. He may come in your lifetime. It could be while we are living here on planet earth. And when you read how glorious that occasion, and we'll get there in a moment, how glorious that occasion is going to be, wouldn't it be incredible to be a part of that? When Jesus comes back, that that we have read of, that which we have been taught, that which has been preached to us will be a a reality. It'll be real. Paul chimed in on this in 1 Corinthians. He said, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That means we shall not all die. Now we're going to talk more about that in a moment because that gets to a point where that brings up some questions. We're going to cover it in a moment. He says there's something that I want you to realize so I'm going to reveal this to you. There will be those living when Jesus comes back who know him as their Lord and Savior. Which brings up the next point, a return. Verse 16, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. As I've told you many times, there were times when God sent a particular angel for a particular job. We see this at the birth of Jesus. We see it also at the ascension of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, and many points in between. God would send angels, or as in the case of his transfiguration of our Lord, he sent a couple of guys who had been dead for a long time back to witness that marvelous event. But when Jesus comes back, He don't send an angel. He don't choose the highest ranking angel. No. He does it Himself. Right before Jesus ascended and went back to heaven, He sent an angel I can picture this in my mind. 
Jesus has been talking to the 11. And all of a sudden, he just ascends up. To ascend means to raise. He just goes up. He rises into the sky. And I've wondered sometimes, you, you take a, a helium balloon and you turn that loose and you watch it and you track it and it gets farther and farther and farther away till it gets to a point where you don't see it anymore with the naked eye. You, you can't see it visually. I've got an idea that's what the disciples were doing, watching. So the ascension angel told them, this same Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner. Now he's taken up. He's ascended. But when he comes back, he will descend. But the common ground here is the fact that the one who went up, that's Christ, is coming back in the same manner. A return. That's what I was talking a moment ago about. The fact that the world has lamb-blasted Christianity for continuing to preach and to teach the return of Christ. And they're saying mean, hateful things. Where is the return of the Lord? Where is the promise? You know what I want to say to those people? Just hold on. <laughs> Just hold on. Time yet. When the Father says the time is right, it will happen. A return. Then there's a resurrection. Verse 16. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. The dead in Christ. Those who died left this world physically. Their body wore out. It ceased to be. And they died. Physically, they died. But that was just the body. Where is the soul? The soul is at rest. Resting in Jesus. The body it's taken back to the ground, figuratively from whence it came. It's placed back in the earth in some shape, form, or fashion. Soul is with Jesus. So when Jesus comes back, coming for two groups, right? those who are living in Christ and those who have died in Christ. And you know which group gets his attention first? Those who have died. Those who have known the sadness of going through physical death. Heard it said many times, some of the most beautiful places, and they should be that way. Some of the most beautiful parcels of ground on this earth are well manicured cemeteries that are taken care of, and they should be. Someday. Someday they're not going to look anywhere near the way they do now. There will be graves. You say, Ronnie, you believe that? Absolutely. 
there will be graves burst open. And that old body, maybe nothing but bones, will come up out of the ground. And don't take that as some horrible sight. Who in the world would want? No, no. Because there's going to be a replacement. They're going to get a brand new body. But the point is, the first group that receives the attention of the Lord Jesus Christ concerning those who are in Christ is those who have died in Christ. This church, well, this one, but this church at Thessalonica, they needed to hear that. Because remember, they were so upset about loved ones who had put their trust in Christ, but they had died. Well, Paul wants to encourage them. They'll be the first group that goes. Then there's a rapture. Here's where we get into that thing that's a little controversial. It really shouldn't be. Verse 17, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. You ever wonder why Paul said we? Would that apply that he thoroughly believed that he would be living when Jesus comes back? I think so. And whether that's actual fact, which I believe it is, does not change the reality. That's the way we should live. With stone hard faith and knowledge that Jesus is coming back. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up, caught up. Now I want you to pay close attention to that little phrase, caught up, because there's always those that will say the word rapture is not in the Bible. Well, our spelling and our understanding of the word R-A-P-T-U-R-E is not in the Bible, no. But an examination of that little phrase, caught up, is important. It's derived from a Latin term. The term is raptural. Guess what English word we get from that? Rapture. Rapture. So when, when, when you study this through translation, the word rapture is in Scripture. It's right there. It's just a compound phrase. Caught up. Rapturo. Now, does this create a problem with Hebrews 9, verse 27. Is there an issue here? Now, so far we've talked about the fact that we who are alive and remain living on earth when Jesus comes back, does that mean that we won't have to die? Here's where the problem is. Hebrews chapter 9, 27. It is appointed for men to die once. But after this, the judgment. I've told you many times, oft times, that's an appointment that every one of us will keep. Every single one of us. Is there 
a conflict. No. No. When Jesus Christ returns, a person goes from the physical to the spiritual. Get that. Grasp it. At the return of Jesus, everything changes. A person goes from the physical, we're alive, we remain, and we transition to the spiritual. So at that time, all living believers will experience death of the natural body. They may be living, but that body, even as a saved person, that flesh that they lived in and we live in is still prone to what? Sin. We still have a sin nature even though our soul is saved. When Jesus comes back, that all changes. So in the bigger picture, in reality, we do die. There is no conflict between what we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and Hebrews 9 verse 27. No conflict whatsoever. We will die. If you want to get right down to it, those of us who are saved, Jesus died in our place. When Jesus died on Calvary, he died our death. The horrible death that we should have had to go through, he died in our place. We transition from the physical to the spiritual. And what a change that's going to be. I was talking at, preaching at Sandy's funeral the other night. We talked about heaven will be a place of no mores. N-O-M-O-R-E-S. No mores. No more suffering. No more sadness. No more death. None. What a place it's going to be. So there's a realization, Paul said, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep. There's a rest. They are resting in Jesus. There's a revelation. When Jesus comes back, the first group that he takes with him are those who have died asleep in Christ. There's a resurrection. They come forth out of the grave. Transition back to those who are living. There's a rapture. We also go through a death. We move from the physical to the spiritual. So that pretty much covers everything, right? Not really. There's a couple of more. There's a reunion. Verse 17. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. Who? The dead in Christ. We'll be caught up together with them them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Reunion. Everyone in this auditorium, I feel safe saying this, every single one in this auditorium has had the sad task of going to a graveside somewhere and saying your final respects to someone you loved so dear. Your parents, a spouse, for some of you, it's unthinkable. 
a child, a sibling, grandparents, and we could go on and on and on. But if that person had their faith and trust in Christ, and you have your faith and trust in Christ, when Jesus comes back, they'll be, we'll be caught up together with them. Those who preceded us. Those who went before. What a reunion that's going to be. I said at Sandy's service the other night, I think we'll know each other in heaven. We won't know each other as husband, wife, mom, dad, brother, sister, but I think we'll know each other. I really do. David, who was so broken because of the death of a little child, which resulted in the fact that he made a huge mistake. The child was sick. It was pretty obvious he was, it was going to die. He prayed for that child. He's broken hearted. He knows what he did was wrong. He says, oh Lord, spare this child if it's your will. He didn't eat. He didn't bathe. He didn't take care of the affairs of the kingdom. When the child dies, his men come to tell him. As soon as they come into the chamber, he knows. He knows. He says, is the child dead? Yes. Yes, O king, the child is dead. David says, whew, I'm hungry. He hadn't eaten in days. I smell pretty bad. Have the chef fix me a meal. Have them prepare me a place to bathe. Get the cabinet people in. I need an update on what's going on in this nation. They're amazed so much that they said, O oh, king, when the child was still living, you prayed and you struggled and we dreaded so much to tell you that the baby's dead. He said, I did that because the child was alive. There's no reason to pray any longer. God in his sovereign will has taken the child to be with himself. Here's what he said. He said, I can't bring that child back. But he said, I can go and be with the child. I think we'll know each other in heaven. And he closes, what a wonderful benediction, with a reassurance. Verse 18, therefore, comfort one another with these words. That's why I said a moment ago, in the middle of so much uncertainty in this world, Reeling and rocking? I tell you that one of the best things that we can say to each other as children of God is, brother, I'm praying for you. I want you to know that. I'm praying for you. We're going to get through this. I want you to remember that Jesus is going to come back and get us very soon. Someone told me that no matter what I was in the middle. That would lift my spirits. That would be a reminder to me that soon my Lord was coming back. See that big calendar. See it as I said this morning, circle. Dr. Jeremiah told Sheila Wash, it may be so much sooner than any of us could imagine. So let's bow our heads together. The important thing is to...